Good evening friends. Welcome to this video. Now as you see this is a quite unknown. I think we read it right from the days of our school. Uh, the, the Newton's uh, theory of gravity. Right. So you see here I have written that fg equals to g m1 m2 divided by r squared. Nothing new. Right. But what I'm going to show you in this particular proof in this particular equation, I am give, going to give you a complete proof. Now, what do we mean by this word a complete proof? Complete proof name means I have studied through the websites and different videos in YouTube. Although those videos give a very thorough and a mathematical understanding of Newton's uh, theory of gravity, but I would like to deduce this entire equation and what I'd like to show you with a complete proof how Isaac Newton appeared for this particular equation. So that is why I use this word complete proof. In this complete proof, I would assume two, three things and you can look up to my other videos. Uh, in those videos, I have uh, produced the deduction. But however, I would stick to the basic simple mathematics and I would like to show you that how this particular equation uh, Isaac Newton arrived to that. Now before we go ahead what I am going to show you this particular equation what does it mean that the force between two objects multiplied by the gravitational constant and divided by the radius between them square of the radius between them. So we would proceed with our proof. So what we are going to do is that first in this particular proof I am going to show you this particular equation which we are first going to prove. Uh, what we are going to see is this one. Force is inversely proportional to 1 upon r squared. So this is the first proof that we are going to see. So this tells, we will take two approaches to prove it. The force of the gravity acting between two objects uh, is inversely proportional to the square of the separation of distance between the objects mm. from the centers. Right. So just note that this is a proportional sign. It is not an equal to sign. If you really wonder what is the difference between proportionality and equality, you can note out, you can watch out my another video where I have, uh, you know, explained a little bit more about uh, uh, what is proportionality and equality. First, we will go this and we will take twofold approach. We will take two approaches in order to prove that. In order to go for this particular uh, proof, what I would like to draw a simple figure. Right. Say this is uh, this is uh, this is a circle, and here is our sun. Right. This is our sun, and uh, uh, I would also like to show that uh, this is our Earth. So this is our Earth, which is stationed over here. So let me write it. Uh, this is Earth. right and let us call this as sun right and uh, what we do is that this this would be going around and the distance between this and this let us call it as r this one the radius this earth actually moves at a velocity of say for example v let us assume that the velocity is v right and uh, this is the movement uh, which happens so first of all, as you note that when this things, uh, when, uh, and when the acceleration due to change in direction happens, that when, that when, when this earth will go around this sun, okay, it will generate a kind of an acceleration. Uh, this acceleration is due to the change in direction. So we can call this as AC equals to V squared upon R. Right, this is the acceleration due to the change in direction, due to this movement. Just note, this is basically the acceleration due to the change in direction. This is not the centripetal force that we are talking about. Please note that this is acceleration due to the change of direction. Now, this requires a deduction, which is there in another video. I am not going further with that. Now, we also know that force 
equals to mass times acceleration from Newton's second law. So if I substitute this value over here, if I substitute the value of a over here, what we are going to get is this. So we get f equals to mass time v squared r, right? And this is by substituting this value, what we get over here, this particular equation, we can call this particular equation is called centripetal force. This is the centripetal force, right? You can see my another video how uh, this centripetal force has been, uh, you know, deduced. But as you see that if this value of A is substituted over here, then we get this particular equation. Now what we are going to do is that the time that Earth takes around rotating around the Sun, let us consider that time to be T. So I can consider T, T equals to time. So I take T equals to time, the time taken by the Earth to complete one complete revolution. Now, what is velocity? So we know velocity, if I call, this is distance by time. I'm taking just the simple equation. I'm not taking the uh, differential or uh, the, the, the differential part of this. So velocity equals to distance by time. Now, what is this distance? This distance is this one, which the Earth goes around the Sun, right? So this is what? This is a circle. So the distance would be the circumference, right? So from here, what I can write over here is that the distance traveled by the Earth around the Sun distance is equal to the circumference is equal to the circumference and what is the circumference it is 2 pi r right so from here what we can write is that we can write velocity is equal to, equals to distance which is 2 pi r and we have assumed time as t so we can write this as t Right, so velocity equals to distance by time, which is uh, 2 pi r by t. I think this is quite clear. So we have arrived with the velocity part. Now you see that force, uh, let me use a different color so that it becomes clear for you. Okay, so you see now force equals to mv squared by r, which we have found by the acceleration when we have put this value. So now what we are going to do is that we can write from here f equals to mv squared by r, right? This is the same equation. And we know that velocity is this one. So we can call this as v, right? Velocity. So when we square it, what it will become? It will be, uh, m will be just as it is, right? And this will become uh, 2 pi r, right? And this would be by t, which will be the time, whole squared, and this r will remain as, as it is. So it will be r, right? From here, what we get, we can write here this part. So what we get is 4, 2 squared, m, let us write it, this one, pi squared, this one, r squared, this one, whole divided by t squared and whole divided by r, right? So from here what we get is that the r gets cancelled out, right? So here we get this. So from here what we get, let us see. So we further rewrite this equation and this becomes something like this. It, this becomes equal to, let me use a different color so that um, we can see the final equation much better. So this equation has finally come to this. So this has become 4 m pi 2 r for sorry this would become let me write it over here this has become 4m 
pi squared r by t squared right so this is the equation which we have got till now now so i think this part is quite clear so how we got this the, uh, this is how we did it right now uh, Newton uh, actually got a lot of help from Kepler's third law, right? So uh, he was once asked that, how did you deduce the equation of gravity? So he answered by continually thinking. So what is Kepler's third law? So uh, before arriving to the Kepler's third law, what I would like to show you is something like this. I will keep this equation apart because we will be needing this. So you see this one. I will come to Kepler's law uh, uh, in a short while. So you see this is an ellipse. This is called the semi-major axis. This is called the semi-minor axis. This is the focus and this is perihelion, aphelion. We will deal it with later. So what is the Kepler's third law? Kepler's third law says that the square of the orbital period, that means the time which this one takes, the orbital period, right? So Kepler tells that the square of the orbital period of a planet is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis, this one, of its orbit. Clear? So let me repeat. Kepler says the square of the orbital period of a planet is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. Right. So from this particular diagram, you can understand this part is called the semi-major axis. You might be thinking about the deduction part of the Kepler's law. Well, we can deal it with later. Let, let us see what Newton uh, actually arrived using this Kepler's law. So in, in mathematical terms, what we can write Kepler's law as we have found it, square of the orbital period, so the time taken, which we can call t square, is proportional to the cube, right? Uh, it is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. So I can call the semi-major axis as R and this becomes R cube. From this previous equation, what we have seen is that F, let me write that equation for you, equals to 4m pi squared, right? R whole divided by t squared. This was our earlier equation, right? Now, for example, this part is also t squared and what I can do is that from here, I can definitely write uh, this part that t squared equals to r cube followed by a constant, right? Now, uh, how, why do we use a constant in proportionality? This is another issue. We can, you can look up on my uh, another video onto this. Now, what I can do is that I can substitute this value over here. So what it would become, f will be equal to uh, 4m, this would be the same, uh, pi squared r, right? And this would be substituted by this one, that is, uh, say, r cube uh, dot k, that is the constant, right? So now what it becomes, so this one gets cancelled out right so this gets cancelled out and we get a r squared now let me use a different color and write it over here so now we get the equation as f okay okay f this one equals to uh what we got here 4m pi squared and this has got cancelled out right and we get at the denominator r squared dot k, r squared k, right? So from here, what we can also uh, write over here is that, uh, yeah, so now you see, now you see, now you see that m is a constant. So we can write here m is a constant, right? Pi is also a constant, pi is also a constant. K is also a constant. K is also a constant, right? 
and this one r is the radius which keeps on varying for different planets and different planetary system so once the, all these things are constant m pi and k we can call them call this as one which is the constant part so from here what we get is f if i put all those things and even four is a constant four is also a constant so what we get is one by r squared so here is the proof which we started with you see we started in order to prove that force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between two objects right from the center here is what we have done so you might be wondering that these are all constants even 4 is a constant so if these constants are being substituted by 1 what we get is 1 upon r squared now with this f equals to 1 upon r squared we are going to take another approach this approach will also prove uh, the, uh, the this particular equation but it is important let us look into it uh, so what we will do is that suppose this is this uh, this is the sun and let us suppose this is the earth right this is the sun and this is the earth now if this body is exerting a force on this way and this body is also exerting a force in this particular direction this one and this one and if I call this body as big M and if I call this body as small M then we know that F is directly proportional to M and from here also we know F is directly proportional to small M right now if I take the previous uh, picture and if we redraw it once more if I take the previous picture which is this one right and here is the Sun and here is the earth right and this one has got a radius r and this is moving at a velocity of v say for example if I consider those values then the velocity uh, changes and uh, let us say the orbital period so we will take here orbital period as t we take the orbital period as t so what we get from here is the velocity is changing hence it has got an acceleration right the velocity is changing along with the movement so it has got an acceleration so we will use the same equation that acceleration due to the uh, uh, due to the due to the change uh, acceleration yes uh, due uh, due to the change from the center would be v squared by r this we have also seen in the previous equation right so now from this particular equation as we know that f is proportional to m and f is also uh, in one way it would also be proportional to a that is the acceleration right so what we can do from here we can write f is directly proportional to a right and f is also directly proportional as and because a is this one so from here it implies that f is directly proportional to v squared upon r this is also directly proportional to v squared upon r now we take the same approach it is little bit different you will understand distance is also sorry i'm so sorry this would be velocity is also equal to distance upon time right this is the distance and this is the time so velocity is also equal to the distance by time and as we have noted distance is also equals to 2 pi r by t 2 pi r this is the circumference and we have got the t at the denominator right so we have got the distance substituted uh, to this one as 2 pi r by t so this one is the circumference and this one is the orbital period this is the circumference this is the orbital period now following from this equation uh, so let us write it once more so distance as we have calculated uh, would be uh, distance this one 
would be equal to 2 pi r by t 2 pi r by t right now from here what we get is that velocity is also proportional so we can write from here v, v is proportional to r by t right right because 2 pi i am taking this 2 pi to be constant this 2 pi i am taking to be constant so that is why from this particular equation which is velocity distance by time and because distance is 2 pi r so i can write uh, omitting 2 pi r i can write velocity is proportional to r by t now because we need a kind of a v squared you see we we have got a v squared a situation over here so let us let us uh, square both the sides so let us square both the sides so what i will do is that i will square this part and i will square this part also right so from here what we get is that v squared equal to r squared by t squared i'm not writing it now again from the kepler's law which we have seen it earlier from kepler's law so let me write it uh, from kepler's law which we have already known we have got r cube is directly proportional to t squared which is we have uh, i think or t squared uh, is directly proportional to r cube which we have seen and from this part what i can write is that r cube i can write r cube equals to k dot t squared because we are putting up a constant right so from here what we can do is that we can write velo velocity squared is directly proportional to r squared and this one uh, r squared and this one would be so uh, this one would be substituted by so uh, so from here what we can further deduce i can write t squared equals to let me write it this for a capital anyway it doesn't matter t squared equals to r cube by k so i just make it different right so from here what we get velocity squared equal to r squared this one and t squared will be substituted by this one so what we get is r cube dot k clear right so this get cancelled out and what we get is an r so what from here what we get is velocity squared equals to 1 upon r 1 upon r now i will use a different color again we know uh, from the previous uh, equation if i may show you velocity squared equals to v squared by r from this particular equation this right so from here what we can also show you is that uh, because f squared is it directly proportional directly proportional to v squared by r so let me write it for you v squared by r right so from here what we do is that no this one is so sorry it would be force right four squared no <laughs> this is a mistake yeah so it would be v squared by r and i can also write f is directly proportional now v squared is 1 by r right so we write 1 by r multiplied by 1 by r right and what we get from here is f is directly proportional to 1 upon r squared right so this is another way as you have seen from we started from uh, we started from here yeah we started the second approach from here and what you have seen is that it is the same approach but we used a little bit of different mathematics and we substituted the values of Kepler's law and we got the same result. So we have finally deduced by these two ways uh, how we can uh, find out that force is inversely proportional to the square. So that is very, very important. Without this Newton wouldn't have got the uh, final approach in order to find out those values. Right. So now uh, we come to the final part of the video. Now we come to the final part of the video and through which we can now find out the deduction. Now you see, uh, we know that F is directly proportional to M1, M2, which we already know that the uh, force is directly proportional to the masses. And we also know now that force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Now I can write using proportionality constant right 
using proportionality constant, what I can do is that we also know from here f equals to, uh, if I put a constant that is k, m1, m2, this these two parts, whole divided by r squared. Yeah, but here k is not equal to 1. Here a k is not equal to 1. So what we do from here is that we get the final equation f. Because it is not equal to 1, we put a value of g m1 m2 whole divided by the square of the distance between the center of the two masses radius. So this is how we have finally arrived at the equation and we have proved it that f equals to g m1 m2 whole divided by r squared. Here is a small catch before we end the video. Now you see this one is not equal to 1, right? Now if I take further, say for example I draw a line so that you can understand this is a different part. F force is directly proportional to M, right? Force is also directly proportional to A, that is acceleration. We know force is also directly proportional to MA, right? Now using the property of constant from here what we can write is this one force okay is equal to k times m a right where k is a constant and if i use k equals to 1 my equation becomes f equals to m a right which we are quite common common now the thing which you might be wondering is that how come here k is not equal to 1 and here k becomes equal to 1. How come this happens? Is science behaving in a different way? Certainly not. Certainly not. So now what you need to understand is that when k was equal to 1, that is this particular case. Now uh, during uh, in this time we actually didn't knew the value of 1 Newton. We didn't knew the value of 1 Newton, right? So 1 Newton can be weight of this pen. Well, 1 Newton can be weight of this uh, this part, right? 1 Newton can, be, can also be the weight of my charger. This one also, it can be this one. So we don't know actually what we should use or what would be the standard for 1 Newton. So what we did is that we assumed F equals to 1 Newton, right? Mass we assumed as 1 kilogram, right? Acceleration we also assumed as 1 meter per second squared. So if all these values are 1, so what it would become? It would become F equals to MA, KMA. And because this is 1, it would become F equals to MA, right? Because k equals to 1. Here we assume k equals to 1. That is the reason here we are using an equal to sign and this equation. Right. But when we arrive with this particular form, this particular form where f is not equal to 1. This is not equal to 1. We already knew the value of f. We already knew the value of mass in terms of kilogram. We already knew the value of acceleration. We already knew the value of this radius. So we have to deduce the value of G which was actually done by this famous physicist uh, Lord Henry Cavendish. Lord Henry Cavendish used a torsion method in his laboratory in order to calculate the value of G which came to be 6.67 into 10 to the power minus 11 which we already know Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. So now you understand this equal to because this one is not equal to 1. We have to find out a value for this G. And this was done by Henry Cavendish using the torsion experiment in his laboratory. Whereas here you see that F equals to MA because we don't know those values. We don't, didn't know what was 1 Newton. What standard we we use in order to calculate the value of 1 Newton. So we assume all this to be 1 and substituted by 1 the equation becomes F equals to MA. Right. 
So I think that we are done. Uh, so you, now you see that how we have finally arrived at this equation. So what we did actually, we started with uh, this particular part where we proved first that force is inverse, the inverse squared law, I will call. And we use the centripetal force. We, we use the, uh, I'm so sorry, this is the centripetal force. We use this value and then we calculated it from this part. And then we finally arrived with this part and we got this one. This is the first one. Using the same but little bit of mathematical trick, what we got is the same answer that this force is inversely proportional to 1 upon r squared, right? And then what we used, we used the proportionality signs in order to find out and prove this one. And we should note that here, because k, the constant is not equal to 1, because by the time we arrived at this equation, we knew all those values, but f equals to ma, where we have put the values deliberately as 1, because those values are not known. I think this proves and we have finally concluded this. I hope you like this video because it is one single proof or a one single video which gives you a complete deduction of the inverse squared law and we have finally arrived at the conclusion. If you are wondering about the difference between equality and proportionality, please watch out my second video. Stay safe, stay happy and wish you all the best for the coming days. Bye.